um thanks everyone for joining uh, good afternoon i hope you all had a nice uh, lunch break um uh, to track b uh, we have diego with us uh, diego thank you very much for joining us today uh, with a much needed topic on um, selenium grid 4 and apium together in harmony uh, with no further delay um, diego over to you thank you uh, hi everyone good afternoon for most of you good morning for all the other ones who are here in um, the European time zone, and maybe good middle in the night <laughs> for the ones who are attending from the uh, American continent. Um, right, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, super glad to be in Appium Conference for the second time. And today I want to share um, what we have been doing with the Selenium Grid 4 and how it will work with Appium. So, First of all, for the ones who don't know me, I am Diego. I work with the Selenium project. I am a part of the team that is developing the upcoming Selenium 4 version. And um, if you're interested to join us, to help us in the project, to um, somehow make Selenium better for you and for everyone, please um, let us know. I will share some links at the end of the slides uh, that you can just get the contacts for the, our Slack channel, our email. Um, group so you can join us and you can help us to make Selenium better. I am also part of um, the open source uh, program office at Source Labs. Um, I am a staff software engineer over there. And thanks to that, I have plenty of time to um, contribute to open source and especially to Selenium. Uh, so thanks to both organizations, both teams to support me in my open source and contribution journey. So let's get started. Um, what we want to cover today is uh, several topics. One is we're going to understand how the new grid works. And we are going to go a bit into the detail of why Appium wasn't working with, with the grid 4. And then we're going to jump like, how are they going to work together? What's the um, process? What are the moving pieces of them, like having, having them working together? And in the end, um, I'm going to share a few tips on uh, like how you could migrate to grid 4 if you haven't done that yet. And some final thoughts. Right, so let's let's start. Um, grid 4, pretty new. We wrote that from scratch, and I would like to share why we did that. Uh, I'm going to share the architecture, and I'm going to share um, a demo of its major features and different ways of uh, use. Right, so the first question that many people have asked themselves, and I was also asking myself when we started with this, um, the grid is written from scratch, completely new, right? And to be honest, I must confess, I was one of the ones saying, like, why do we need to do this? Like, things are already working. And why do we need to break everything apart and do it again? And I have to say that Simon was right. He had very good reasons. And one of them is that uh, as a team, we, we, we agreed that it was hard to maintain. It was agreed that um, it was incredibly uh, sophisticated. So if you took a look to the code, the, the, the structure of it was like really, really smart, but really hard to maintain and understand and read because it was like extremely configurable, extremely um, uh, extendable. So many things you could do with it but at the same time, it was really hard to understand and to maintain. And only a couple of people were aware how to do that. And sadly, they were not at the project anymore. Also, when that grid came to be part of the Selenium project, um, we had different code bases. So the thing is that the typical hub and node mode and the standalone mode were different set of codes. So if you were running standalone and you were maybe uh, having a successful test, uh, but then you went bumping into a, into a bug, some situation in standalone, and then you were running hub and node, and this was not what was not happening anymore. Um, so in the end, what was happening is that we had people running a test, working well in, for example, hub and node, and then they were using standalone and things were failing for them. And the explanation for that is that there were different code bases. There were different paths in the code being gone through to actually do what you, you wanted to achieve. And 
This goes together with the hard to maintain, like two different set of code doing the same thing. We fixed a bug in one side, we don't fix it in the other side. So it was really, really complicated to, to maintain this type of things. Um, so with grid four, um, we took the approach of have a unified uh, code base, right? It's much smarter. We have more people who understand the code, more people who have contributed and who can contribute in the future. Uh, but we also have like better things inside the code. For example, we have less traffic internally, which was one of the things that Grid3 um, was suffering from. Uh, so when the grid had high load and there was like internal traffic checking health checks and stuff like that, um, therefore, in that case, the, the problem was that really, really um, the grid was under high pressure. And now in grid four, we have taken that um, pain away by having different ways of handling internal traffic. And we'll, I will show an example of that in a moment. And um, obviously, as I said, we have more contributors to it. And together with that, um, we are going to take advantage of modern infrastructure. For example, this new grid has uh, support for Docker containers uh, built in. So you could have something like a dynamic grid. Um, you can have containers being created on the fly when you're running tests. So this is already built in and you don't have to plug different things around. Um, we also have distributed tracing tools that bring you more observability and many more things that take advantage of the, of the new type of infrastructure we have today, such like cloud and, and like different databases and different types of, of um, data storages to back the, the Selenium grid for. So it's a brand new grid, right? And we wrote it from scratch. And one of the plus things of doing that is that we know how a grid should work and we have learned all that from the past. So we can are, we're able now to like put that into practice. We of course still support the standalone mode. You can run it as if you were running grid three, you can also do it with grid four. Um, so in that uh, aspect, for example, you can just keep your original flow, just move to grid four, start it as a standalone. The common changes a bit, but in the end, they're gonna have the same environment you were having with grid three. We also support the hub and node mode. It works very similar to what it was working before. Internally, there are differences, but for the user, for the person who wants to run tests against the grid, it's exactly uh, the same thing. But now let's go a bit deeper into the details of what has changed. You can also run the new grid in a fully distributed mode. And this means that you can take each one of the pieces that composes a grid and run it um, apart. And this is extremely good if you want to scale up a grid, I don't know, 200, 300 nodes, this is very positive. Uh, for example, we have a router that is in charge of being the entry point of the grid. We have a, a, a queue, we have a session map, and I will explain slowly what each of these components do. But one of the important things is that, for example, the queue and the session map have been developed in a way that in the future, we can actually put a different type of storage. So for example, we can have a session map that is storing the relation between the sessions that are running and the node where the session is running. We can put something like Redis on the back so you can start scaling up this component. Um, I will give you a few examples in, in a moment. So let's talk about the ways the new grid work. Let's talk about the node registration. Normally, uh, how it works today is that a node will talk to the event bus. The dotted line means that it's a message then sent through the bus. So the node will send a, a message and the bus will um, facilitate its, its uh, communication. And it will say, hey, I am a node and I have um, these browsers ready for you. And then what happens is that the distributor is the one listening to this type of registration uh, message. The distributor will listen to it, will say, okay, there is a new node. I want to double check that this node actually exists. 
it makes an HTTP call. So the solid line is an HTTP call. And it says, okay, there is a node there, it exists. So I will register it. How does the new session work? You in your laptop or your CI CD system start a new session. The request will come to the router, right? And then the router will say, oh, this is a new session. I need to send this to the queue. The queue will store it there and it will wait there for a while. And in intervals, the distributor is asking the queue, give me the new sessions, give me the new requests for a session. Then we'll take those, uh, we'll take a batch of sessions of pending to be served, and it will start checking around the different nodes, which node can serve the session. Then it will find one, it will create the session, and as a last step, it will tell the event bus, okay, there is a session which is being served by this node. So that data is going to be stored in the session map, right? And why is this important? You will see it in the next slide. For example, you create a new session and you have a web driver command. For example, I don't know, load a page. Then the router will see this is not a new session request. This is a command for, the, for an existing session. Then I will ask the session map, I have this ID, I have this session ID. Could you please tell me in which node is this um, session running? And then the, uh, the command will be forward right away. Um, and with this, I want to uh, re remind you that this is like a smarter way of routing things. Like only a couple of components are involved here. And for example, the heavy load that is being done uh, by the distributor uh, is not affected by this. So in this way, the, the grid is already much smarter than, than the previous one. But let's have a short demo. Uh, well, actually this one is not so short. Um, let me show you how the grid works. So let's first talk about the standalone grid. And we're gonna start a, a grid in standalone mode in a very simple way. We can see that the grid detects how many processors are available. So it recommends to have maximum of 12 um, tests on, on each type of browser. And then we're gonna have a look. This is the new UI as well. We can see that we have the different browsers there. We can see that for example, for Chrome on, on a Mac, it's gonna have 12 available slots. And for example, in Safari, you can only run one session in Safari at the same time. So it's gonna have only one available, right? But you could see that based on the 12 processors that were identified, we're gonna have maximum concurrency of 12 sessions. So let's turn uh, a few tests, very simple tests. They're just gonna go to a website, load it and move to the next one. So actually this is not really a test. This is just an automated script. We're not doing any checks, any verifications, any nothing in that regard. So we run the we run the script. Um, we see how dynamically the the UI is going to show us that sessions are loading, that sessions are are happening, and we can switch to the session tab and we can get tons of information from the um, the UI, what the session has, the different capabilities that are being used during this session, and this is super practical for the the buggability uh, purposes. Now let's jump to Docker, for example. Um, I will share the links showing you how you can do this on your own uh, at the end of the slides. But here we're starting a, a typical hop node uh, setup with, with um, Docker. So things are starting normally. And then when I load the UI, we're gonna have three nodes, Edge, Chrome, and Firefox with their versions and maximum concurrency of one um, in this case. That's the default. Let's run the tests, the same ones I was running before. And we're gonna see how the UI already shows that uh, the sessions are coming there. And one of the cool things we have in the new grid is that you can switch to a session and actually you can see what is happening in there because we have VNC ready for you. So you can also debug and see what is going on in the different um, 
uh, sessions uh, and tests that are running. So you can interact with the browser, you can post your test, you can debug it, and everything from the UI of the new grid. Uh, one of the cool things is that you don't need any extra setup. Like you just need to start the Docker containers with the recommended configuration in, in the project. And that's pretty much it. I was talking that the new grid has uh, Docker support embedded. So you can have a dynamic grid. In this case, we start a grid and we have the possibility to run up to five sessions with Chrome, Firefox, or, or Edge. And with that, we can, we can start containers in the background without the need to plan a huge grid in advance. One of the important things here is that if you want to record video, which is also included, you need to add a few capabilities. For example, you have to say record video true. You can set a time zone. You can set a screen resolution. And you can even add metadata for your test, like the name over there. Let's run those tests. And then what we're going to have here is um, a few tests running in the grid. We can see how the concurrency is getting used. But more interestingly, we're going to see how Docker containers are getting started and disposed in the background. So we can see that there is a container for the browser. There is a container for the video recording. So you have to be very uh, mindful about the resources you have in your machine because you cannot run 10 tests in parallel if you have only like four CPUs available. So this is very, very important to have stable tests. How does the configuration look, right? You have a Docker image in the, on, on the left side saying, this is a Firefox uh, container. And on the right, you have the stereotype that says, this is Firefox in the platform Linux. And you can enrich the stereotype as much as you want. The same thing for Chrome, the same thing for Edge. So here, we're going to see what are the outputs of running these tests. Because I already mentioned that you can record video, but how does this look? So you have to mount a, a, a directory, but you will get the output of these files. That ID is the session ID, right? So you're going to have all the session IDs that you were executing a moment ago. And then you can see the video that was produced. And you can also see the capabilities that were part of this session. So you can see, for example, what browser was being used, the metadata you were adding to it. So you can easily parse this data and maybe build a, um, a dashboard for your tests if you wish. And the tests uh, have their video. It looks pretty slick. And that's mostly what you have when you use a dynamic grid. Now let's talk about scaling up, right? One of the complaints that we got about the three was that it was really hard to, to scale up. So I took the time to build a Terraform script that I can share with you if you want. And I started that grid with 100 nodes in AWS. So I'm going to run uh, up to 100 tests in parallel. Um, and you can see simply how the concurrency is going up as more tests are getting sent and started in the grid. So I did this uh, last night. And it takes a while to bootstrap all the infrastructure. But when you have it there, it's actually pretty, pretty fast. So the trick here is to find ways how to bootstrap the infrastructure um, fast enough so your tests can run and you can also be uh, saving costs in the cloud. Um, right, so you can also have all the, all, the, all the nice things that I was showing you locally. You can have the live session, you can have everything. It doesn't matter if you run it in the cloud or locally or uh, I don't know, in an internal server. Um, all these features work wherever you deploy the grid. So we can see how the tests were running, I think, for a minute. And then it's like ramping down already. And um, this is mostly the, the, the core of the features of the new grid that you can use already, even though it's on release candidate. But we have no major changes to do. Um, so I hope that you have the time to have a look at them and try it out. So that's about for the demo for the grid. 
let's jump back to the core of this presentation. What is going on with Appian and Grid4? Basically, they don't work. Maybe you already saw why, because then the way a node gets registered to the grid changes. it. So in Grid3, uh, the way to register a node was pretty straightforward. There was a node, and the node was sending a, re uh, uh, a registration request via HTTP with all its characteristics. And the help was saying, yeah, this is a node, it's registered, and so on. Appium server was doing exactly the same thing, sending an HTTP request, registering the Appium server, and that was it. No more, uh, and it was, I would say, pretty straightforward. But one of the issues that we had with this type of integration is that Selenium Grid and Appium were very coupled because the Appium server needed to know the structure of the payload that had to be sent to the server. And this meant that if we wanted to make changes to the grid, to the grid three, we had to coordinate releases. We had to tell people from this version to this version, you could use this and that. So there was kind of coupling between the two projects in that way. In grid four, um, obviously this has changed, right? Because a normal node would easily send a bus message and it will get registered as we saw before. But then what happens with an Appium server? An Appium server will say, hey, here is my HTTP request, registering myself to the grid, but, but where can I register via HTTP, right? Like there is no point to register via HTTP. And here I, I would like to make a parenthesis because one of the questions might be, so why are you using a bus? Why, why, why did you stop using HTTP for, for requests? And one of the benefits of using a bus is that it allows and enables scaling up. In the future, I mean, this is not possible yet, but our plans are to allow users to have, for example, two distributors at the same time, um, two session maps at the same time. And if we do everything via HTTP, the setup is more complicated. If we use a bus for messaging, it's much more simple because everyone can just listen and send messages without having a complex uh, structure of HTTP calls. So, together in harmony, right? How do they work together? What's the architecture? How you can configure Grid4 to use Appium? And a quick demo. So let's take the approach of using the typical hop and node mode. We're gonna have a hop in grid four. And then as I have said, I think already three times, you can register a node with a message uh, through the event bus. I'm not having all the, all the components explained here or, or detailed because they are all living in the hop right now. Um, and then the hub will actually check, okay, you are a, you are a node you are registered. Then we have our Appium server, which normally runs in local hosts 4723. And that's basically the endpoint where we create our tests, where we send our test requests to, to Appium. So how can we connect these two parts? So we have developed a relay server. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be a relay node that will act as an intermediary between the two parts. It will register itself. It will be acknowledged by the grid because it's uh, a node. And what will happen is that this uh, node will be able to relay traffic to the Appium server. So when you create a session, you will send a request to the hub. The hub will say, who is able to match these capabilities? Who has these stereotypes? And then we'll find the relay node. The relay node will basically forward all the requests to that endpoint local host 4723 WD hub, right? So in this way, you can actually just forward things and whatever the Appium server replies, then it just gets forwarded back to, to you as a, as a user. 
one of the interesting things of this approach is that, yeah, we have right now an Atom server that is able to talk web driver via that service endpoint, but you can have anything you want that talks web driver. For example, you can have a grid three. If you're in the process of migrating from grid three to grid four, you can connect your grid three to the relay node and migrate slowly in, in, a, in a way that the pace is good for you, that you can move slowly the components around. And that way you can also, um, yeah, step by step, you can, you can migrate. Another way, other thing that you can do is if you have an account with a cloud provider, you can also have a cloud provider acting as a node in your grid. Because for example, you can have locally, I don't know, Docker containers, and you want to use Mac or other services that are in the cloud, then you can configure that cloud service as an endpoint, and then all tests that cannot be fulfilled locally will be served in the cloud. But how does the configuration look for that? In grid four, we are using extensively uh, TOML configuration files, which are much easier to read than JSON. So in this case, um, we're going to have um, a server that is running on the port 5555. And to avoid all the, uh, the cluttering in the UI, we're going to tell the grid, so please don't detect any drivers, because drivers are normally detected automatically. And um, the interesting part comes on in the relay section. This is where you can specify the URL, which is where the service that is able to start web driver session lives. And optionally, you can um, have a status endpoint. You can say, you know, I want to be sure this endpoint is up before we start the node. So actually the node will double check that this endpoint is up. And the interesting part comes in the configuration, which I will explain a bit more in detail in the demo. In the end, you can start the, the jar in the same way. You can say Java minus jar, et cetera, et cetera. And then you pass at the end the configuration file. Let's move to the demo so we can understand how this works. So here, I'm going to take a moment to explain the configuration first. Uh, as I said, you have uh, an endpoint that is described by uh, URL. And this could be anything that you want. I mean, you can have the app in server somewhere else. The important thing is that the relay server accesses to this, has, has network access to this point. So let's talk about the configurations. In this case, I'm saying that I have maximum one session of this stereotype. I'm going to set the browser Chrome with the platform Android. And this is the Appium version, uh, sorry, the platform version I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use. Please note that platform version is not a standard W2C capability, so it has to be prefixed, but grid four has proper matching for platform version now. Same story for iOS. So let's move to Appium. So we have to start our server, of course. So the, 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 the status, status check works. And we can see how the capabilities are mapped. And if I refresh the UI, I can see already there is Android with Chrome, maximum one session, and the same thing for Safari. And if you hover over it, then you will see the whole description of the, of the slot. Then let's run a couple of tests. A very silly small script checking an iOS app and also an Android browser test. So we're gonna move back here and we can see how the UI is reflecting um, everything. The session is created. And on the right, you can see how the Appium server is getting all the information uh, and just doing its job that it's done very well by, by Appium. Uh, I am missing the, the emulator. So it was actually prompt to a different um, workspace, but the test is running in a very like straightforward way. Let's log into a website and just um, yeah, checking that things are there. So now I'm gonna move the the emulator where the simulator is. And I'm just gonna run the test again so you can see both things working at the same time. And 
in a gist that's almost all the demo because it's pretty straightforward in the sense that you configure your appium endpoint but you are in charge of declaring what capabilities you have available locally you have to say right i have android 10 android 9 android 11 with this type of devices and that's the configuration you need to provide to the relay server because without that you won't be able to uh, actually uh, match the tests requests you are sending to the grid right so um, the test is just now finishing or not really a test a script that loads an app and that's uh, pretty much it so you can see also like the session information when the session starts but obviously there is no uh, live stream since it this only works in docker containers and yeah that's the appium demo so let's go back to the slides let's talk a bit about migration to grid4 the way we have implemented uh, grid4 it should be a drop in replacement for most of the cases but if not obviously there is always a case that this doesn't happen please let us know i will share a link where you can like reach out to us and chat with us via slack or irc and if you're using the docker images many people use docker image with the tag 3 or latest please know that when selling for is released uh, hopefully pretty soon um, we're going to switch latest to 4 so it's a good idea to um, start using the the docker selenium images to get feedback about that um, so we have actually spent quite some time to write detailed instructions of how to use the docker images how they work all their benefits like video recording um, vnc all this and that uh, so please have a look and if you need any help i mean we're there for you and one of the cases that might be tricky for you to migrate is um, when you have developed some custom servlets or custom nodes in grid 3. i believe most of the use cases are covered by other features for example we have graphql available for you to query the grid we have many things such as um, the video recording, the live view that were implemented in other projects before. So if you have a custom um, a customization and maybe you don't find a way to migrate that, let us know and we can talk and we can find ways to, to help you migrate. But obviously a first step to start migrating to grid four is to use the relay configuration. And you can put your existing grid behind that uh, type of node or type of uh, standalone server and already start um, using grid three, grid four, sorry. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, if you need anything from, from us, from the Selenium project or grid or anything, or if you want to start contributing, please go to um, that URL, selenium.dev um, slash support. We have there our email list, our um, link for the Slack channel, IRC. So please join the community and let us know how we can help and let us know how you want to help us as well. So a small recap, um, before going through the detail of this slide, I, I, I just wanted to say that um, the background image means a lot in this case. Um, we have implemented this as a first step to support Appium and I believe it's, it's a good approach so far. Um, and it's something that is there that you can use already. Obviously, there are ways to make this much better, to improve it, and that's why we need your feedback. So we can make it perfect together. Um, and as I said, it's, it's just a way to start. It's a way to find how we can support other use cases uh, with Grid4. But in the end, um, let us know how this works for you. There might be some comments that don't work properly because you are sending comments in, in json wide protocol, and maybe W3C is the preferred way. So please um, try it and let us know what use cases you have. It's much easier if sometimes you just join to the Slack channel and tell us about your use case, because sometimes the, the, the issues that are getting created are very ambiguous and really hard to understand. So either way, try both ways, but feel free to join us in our, in our Slack or IRC channel. 
Um, one of the main things here, the main takeaways away is that, yeah, like the grid and the Appium server are less coupled. They are more independent, but they're together again. So you can use them again. You can run your tests at scale, and hopefully you can uh, share your learnings about that uh, maybe in a future talk or to us in the Selenium project and the Appium project. And yeah, Selenium 4 is coming really soon. Um, I hope this comes uh, really, really in terms of weeks. So we'll see how this goes. And please uh, stay up to date, follow us in the, in the Twitter and in the follow us our blog that we will be posting updates for the upcoming uh, news in Selenium. And with that, I really want to thank you. I tried to do this uh, very timely, so you have a lot of time for questions. Uh, but more than that, I just want to thank all of you for being here, for taking the time to listen to me. And I hope you have a good experience trying out the new grid. And again, thank you. Have a great day and have a great weekend. Thank you, Diego. That was a great session. We definitely have more time for questions. Uh, let me go into the Q&A section. We have about 10 questions. Uh, that's great. And we are about 140 plus people. Oh, that's a great turnout for the session. Um, all right, the first question. I see there are some processes on this grid four before going to a web browser. We are currently using Selenoid GGR, like Selenium grid, and often get a high latency due to too many hops. How about in grid four? Is there any data that we have for latency test? Yeah, um, obviously latency is very relative based on your, um, on where you deploy the grid, where you are having your system under test, because you could have your grid deployed in AWS and your system under test could be on a server next to you. So there will be always latency. So it's it's a very contextual type of sentence. Um, but in grid four, we have, I didn't do a demo about that. I actually forgot. We have observability plugged in. So you can actually uh, run your tests as normal with observability turned on and have your Jagger server or whatever uh, you want to use for that to, co to, to collect the data. And you can see exactly how much each command is taking um, during the whole flow. For example, if you create a session, you can say, okay, the router took this time and then this distributor took this time and the node took this time. So you can see exactly where the latency is gonna be happening. So you could see, okay, maybe the grid is taking half a second creating the session, but like loading the page is taking three seconds. So maybe I have to see what's the connection between my grid and the system under test. Thank you, Diego, for answering that patiently. Um, the next question is from Mohammed Kaja. Um, so he compliments about the nice UA. So I was trying to keep the chat room a little active. Um, so definitely the new grid UI is welcomed. People like it. Uh, but would there be any options to customize that in case if they want to put in the company logo um, or any such um, customization options? I mean, right now, no. I mean, the answer is no. That's the short answer. But this is something uh, I have thought about and, and I haven't really commented with the team, but but I think that would be a nice idea. For example, obviously have like a dark theme or allow you to supply some set of uh, colors. Basically, if you check the UI, it's possible to, um, so it has like two major colors, like, like the, the purple one and then like a lighter one. And, and then you have like some logos. So ideally, yeah, we, we could find a way to customize that, um, but we haven't really thought about it because it's not like something extremely important right now. But yeah, it's something that, we have thought about. Awesome. That will be nice to have. Um, next question I'm going to pick is from uh, Dasu Babu. Uh, we can run parallel testing by given, uh, giving a different Appium port, but what is the advantage of using grid 4 over it? it, it I mean, actually, it, it's just depending on your context because if you are able to handle things by load balance, uh, your own solution between Appium servers, I don't see why you need a grid, right? But if you want to have uh, a, a single place, an entry point where you can have your browsers and your mobile tests 
then that's when it makes sense. Um, it's, it's mostly up to you. I think it's very practical if you want to have a single entry point, if you have maybe in your company two or three teams that don't want to maintain the grid, but they want to run some mobile tests, then you can like gather all this behind the, the, the grid entry point. But obviously there are, I don't know how many, but there are cases where you say, I can have a simple way to balance my five, seven Appium servers, and that's it. Obviously, this is completely optional, and it's a way to help people to scale up their tests together with browsers. Cool, thanks, Diego. Um, next question, um, I'll just ask myself. Um, Diego, have you tried Appium 2.0 yourself? To be honest, I saw demos, and I didn't try it myself because uh, I just didn't have the time. I'm very sorry about that. Right. I think I was, if you said yes, I was going towards um, with this grid four, have you tried connecting with Appium 2? Um, honestly, there wouldn't be much um, of a difference, but I would like to know your experience and your uh, observations on that. Yeah, I mean, I read a bit of the documentation and I saw the demos uh, because I was worried that something in the end point was going to be different. Uh, I mean, something was going to be different. And, and based on that, uh, I took the same approach because it's just an endpoint, right? You just forward traffic and get traffic back. So that's why uh, I focused on something that I had already installed and I wanted to show something working. But no, I haven't really tried it yet. All right, it's not a problem. Um, the next question, uh, Diego, you mentioned about the observability plugin that you forgot to uh, demo, but do you think that can also be used with Appium? That's a good question, and right now it's not possible. But uh, I mean, we have uh, it's it's a matter of conversation, right? Uh, we have to see if the app employee is interested in that, uh, and we can check. We we can work together. Actually, this approach is the is the result of the work of uh, I was talking with Nicola here in in, in Source Labs. We decided this could be a good approach. So, so this is uh, this solution that I'm showing here today is not my. I came up with me. It, 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 I came up with it. I, I, I spoke with with Nicola. I, I, I talked with different people. So we might find a way to do that as well with the Appium project. Uh, but yeah, right now it's not possible. Cool. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Nikhil Grover. Um, how are you able to run iOS simulator in a Docker container? It's technically possible, right? And there are now projects. Uh, so there has been a project for a long time in GitHub that shows you how to run um, um, uh, a, Mac, uh, a Mac OS operating system on, on KVM, and now someone put it in Docker. Um, so this is completely possible. You need a machine that, enable, that facilitates um, uh, nested virtualization, uh, but it's completely possible. However, there are like, things that you need to make, take into account because one of the of the, of the things that Apple is very tricky is that so the Mac OS operating system is free, like different to Windows. So that means you can download it and use it, but the license says that um, you can only use it on Mac hardware. So then you will need to maybe buy a Mac, format it and you enable KVM and run those Docker containers in there. So it's possible. It, technically it's possible, but that you bump into those situations. I was reading that project and it said that Apple was approving that usage uh, if you were gonna use it to report security bugs to Apple, security issues. I don't know, I mean, you, of course you can do it in your company, you can run Docker containers, but if they catch you, uh, I think you're on your own. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, I guess we are out of time. Uh, Diego, thank you very much uh, for spending your time with us and showing us a shiny new UI of uh, Grid4. Uh, it's usually, um, when we talk about Grid4, I remember we usually pair on workshops, but this time it's quite different that I sit on the other side and um, <laughs> you do the talking. It's it's quite a nice experience. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed as well. Yeah, thank you, Manoj. It was uh, a bit like feeling at home again uh, with someone who has like helped me walk through the projects uh, from the beginning. I think the first time we met was in 2017 in Austin or something like right. that. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for hosting the session and thank you to everyone who was at the session for all your questions.